Well, good morning everybody. Welcome to our service this morning. I had said that perhaps we'd be in church today, but the weather is good, so we're outside once again. Well, you know, today is the last day of the church's year. It's Christ the King. So let's just uh, bow heads for a moment and then we'll begin. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so now we're going to come to our introductory prayer. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so now we're going to sing together our first hymn, and what better hymn is there to sing on Christ the King Sunday than Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And so now we come to our time of confession. Uh, this morning we have an introductory sentence and a Kyrie type confession suitable for Christ the King. So please respond when it's the response. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. The kingdom is yours, but we turn away from your just rule. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
The power is yours, but we trust in our own power and strength. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. The glory is yours, but we fall short of the glory of God. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We've done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And so now we have a special prayer of thanksgiving appropriate for this season. Blessed are you, Sovereign God, Ruler and Judge of all. To you be praise and glory for ever. In the darkness of this age that is passing away, may the light of your presence, which the saints enjoy, surround our steps as we journey on. May we reflect your glory this day, and so be made ready to see your face in the heavenly city where night shall be no more. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. And so now Carol Richard is going to uh, give us our reading this morning. She's reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Our reading is taken from St Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so now we have our sermon. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's just bow our heads for a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together, and we ask all that by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your good grace, you'll speak to us now. Amen. Well, once again, good morning. I hope you're well and keeping safe. These are certainly strange times that we live in, aren't they? Who would have thought that following our, our initial coronavirus lockdown in the spring that we will be enduring another in the autumn? Of course, we welcome the good news about the development of vaccines and we naturally trust that when they are eventually rolled out and distributed to the public that they will have the desired results and be effective. But of course, we shouldn't forget the sadness and the sorrow that some people have already experienced, nor underestimate the anxiety that others are still experiencing as they worry about their health, their wealth and their future security. 
Matters which may at times seem to be just too big to handle beyond our control and leading to a sense of helplessness and despair. Which is why I think that our passage for today from St Paul's letter to the Ephesians is so important and so helpful because it fosters a different way of thinking and promotes a completely different perspective. And where does it start? Where does it spring from? Well, of course it starts with prayer. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. A prayer which has itself sprang out of Paul's sense of wonder and delight as he sees that young church being faithful despite the odds and despite the many pressures that, that are stacked against it. Because it was certainly not easy to be a Christian in Ephesus, because as we've mentioned in previous sermons, the city was a melting pot of conflicting religious and philosophical ideas. For not only was Caesar, the Roman emperor, worshipped as a god, it was also a strong centre for magic and astrology. But by any measure you care to use, the city was dominated by its temple to the Greek god Artemis, known to the Romans as Diana. For whereas throughout most of the Greek-speaking world, Artemis was considered to be the virginal sister of Apollo and the goddess of wild animals and hunting, for some reason her adoption in Ephesus took on a much more extreme and eroticised form, where she was considered to be the, the goddess of sex and fertility. Her cult was big business. People would flock to the annual procession of her statue in Ephesus in the hope of finding a husband or a wife, and her temple was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In fact, her temple had previously been destroyed and rebuilt many times, which of course only added to her revered reputation as a goddess of power, fertility and reproduction. In fact, Paul's own ministry in Ephesus had not been uneventful when he had become embroiled in a riot sparked by Demetrius the silversmith. It's worth reminding ourselves just for a moment of that encounter in Acts chapter 29 verses 23 and following. The riot in Ephesus. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has, con has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is a danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So it's no wonder, is it, that Paul is thrilled when he hears how well the church at Ephesus is doing, and this is what he says in verses 15 to 17 of chapter 1. For this reason, he says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now let's be clear about this. The Christians at Ephesus let's be clear about this. The Christians at Ephesus already know the Lord Jesus Christ. They've already come to faith. They are indeed believers. But it's Paul's fervent wish that they should know him more, that they should know him better, and in a much deeper and more profound way. That's why he prays that they might be given a spirit of wisdom and revelation, something to really strengthen their hearts and minds and their confidence in Christ. And with all the other dross and baggage that was going on in their lives, and indeed their city, that's not unreasonable, is it? And of course, this is a lesson for us too, isn't it? It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian or how clever you are, there's always more to learn, more to consider and contemplate, and more to put your confidence in. Don't stop learning. Don't stop thinking or reflecting, because as soon as you do that, thinking that perhaps you've got everything all worked out or all sewn up, you'll start to backslide and you'll start to trip up and be caught out. Which is why Paul also goes on to say in verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope 
to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened or opened as some translations say. What a lovely phrase that is, that the eyes of your hearts may be opened. Now it may seem slightly strange to us that Paul is speaking about hearts having eyes, but it helps if we remember this. That in ancient Jewish thought, it was the heart that was the seat and the centre of one's being. Oh yes, they knew that people had brains, but they thought that they were simply spongy devices used to regulate the temperature of our bodies. Whereas the heart was where everything really happened. That's why heart and mind are so often referred to in the same sentence. And of course, it's all wrapped up so neatly in the great commandment, which is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 30, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And of course, by this, they don't mean this, but this. And the same applies to that other well-known verse so loved by Christians from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. It's all here in the heart. And that's what Paul wants the Ephesians to be deeply rooted in. Not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. Which isn't to say that we shouldn't be intellectual, but that we should be spiritually intellectual, seeing and understanding things with the eyes of our heart, which would be much more in keeping and in tune with God's own heart, which is deeply rooted in love and which is truly transformative. It changes who we are in Christ when we come not only to put our faith and our trust in him as we did when we first became Christians, but as we continue to grow, as we continue to become more like him, as we get to know and understand him better. And it's that which, the Paul, want, it's that which Paul wants us to know and understand. He wants us to know and understand the hope to which we have been called and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And so once again, what is that new hope? Well, it's the transformation of our broken, fallen and sinful world, the world that we know with all of its joys and frustrations, and transformed into the glorious kingdom of God, as the things of heaven transform the things of earth and make them new, heralding the new heaven and the new earth of revelation, the new creation. Now, of course, this all sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But is it just so much pie in the sky, wishful thinking and make-believe? Are we, in fact, being encouraged here to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, turning a blind eye to all the failings of this world that we neglect those who are really suffering? Well, that's a possibility, but I trust it isn't true. Because I believe Paul's prayer and his hopes that we might know Christ with a spirit of revelation and wisdom actually encourages us not just to see the world as we would like it but as it really is but we do so with the love and the mind of Christ who by his spirit is at work in us for the church is the body of Christ not only in some faraway heavenly future but right here in the here and now and that body is no more true I would suggest than when it stands alongside the weak and the disadvantaged and the weak and the suffering and points them in the, in the direction of love and hope. Now, of course, you may say to me, but how is this possible? How can we possibly achieve what you're saying? We don't have the strength, the power or the influence. And in our own strength, you would be absolutely right. We don't. But of course, we don't do things in our own strength, do we? We do it together and in his strength. I can do all things, says the Apostle Paul, through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4 verse 13, which neatly brings us on to the final part of my talk for this morning. The last thing that Paul prays and wants the Christians at Ephesus to know, in verses 18 to 20 of chapter 1, I pray also, he says, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul wants us to know about the power which lies behind us, the power of God. 
Now, a group of theological students were once asked if they believed that Jesus had physically, truly and bodily been raised from the dead, and half of them said no. And when asked why, they answered, because it wasn't rationally possible. And from a purely human perspective, I'm sure we would all agree, it isn't. But since when, since when has God ever been limited to what is purely humanly rational? When we pray, we often ask God to work beyond what is humanly rationally possible. We frequently ask God to act in ways that, can, that only he can achieve, in ways in which we can't imagine and seldom understand. If we only ever limited our prayers to what we could do or achieve for ourselves or understand, then there would be very little point in praying. Those theological students may have been very bright and they might have been using their brains, but they weren't seeing with the eyes of their hearts. In fact, they were blinkered and they had made their God too small. Whereas Paul is trying to encourage the Christians at Ephesus to open their eyes and to get a broader understanding of what and who God is. Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, may once have been blinded upon the Damascus road, but now his eyes are wide open, he has a new perspective, and there is nothing that his God can't do. The raising of Jesus from the dead is proof of it. So where does that leave us at this uncertain point in our national life? and in our own lives too, where it leaves us trusting God. We pray for our Queen, we pray for our Prime Minister, and all those who have power and authority. But regardless of the power that they have and how they choose to use it, we put our faith and our trust chiefly in God and His Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we don't lose heart, nor do we lose courage, nor hope, because through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we know that he is at work in us, loving and transforming the world as we view the world, not just with the thoughts of our heads, but through the eyes of our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our next hymn, just before we go into our time of prayer, is a lovely one. It's called, All Heaven Declares, The Glory of the Risen Lord. Thank you. 
So let us now affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So now our special prayer, our colic prayer, suitable for Christ the King. Eternal Father, whose Son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King, keep the Church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now Di Daniels is going to lead us in our prayers and our intercessions and she'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We pray to God our Eternal Father through our Saviour Jesus, who is both Christ the King and the Son of Man, and who understands our needs and the needs of this world. Eternal Father, we pray for your Church of which your Son is King, asking God to forgive us for the divisions that separate us and to heal the wounds that those divisions cause. We pray that you will draw us together and unite us in the love of Christ, that we may proclaim with one voice your justice and righteousness in a broken world. King of kings and Lord of lords, in your mercy hear our prayer. Eternal Father, we pray for your world of which your Son is King. We pray for peace, reconciliation and healing in the places of war and hatred. We pray that the nations of this world may be united and subject to the rule of Christ the King, through whom and for whom all things were created. We pray for all who hold the power and responsibility that comes with authority. We pray that the spirit of Christ the King will teach them humility and a willingness to stand alongside those who depend on them for leadership. King of kings and Lord of lords, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Father, we pray for our communities of which your Son is King. We pray for the communities of our friends and families, our church and our places of work and study. Help us to know the people around us, to be our brothers and sisters in Christ, and to serve them as Christ the King would serve them. We pray for all who preach and teach in this benefice. Help us, Lord, to listen diligently and learn more of you through them. King of kings and Lord of lords, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift to God those we hold in our hearts, praying for their health, their well-being and their sense of hope. We pray that even when loved ones cannot physically be together, they would not feel apart. We ask for God's help in our communicating, our connecting and our caring. 
King of kings and Lord of lords, in your mercy hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer. We pray that they will know the presence of the Son of Man alongside them and the power of Christ the King within, within them, bringing peace and healing according to their needs. We bring before you now those known to us. Eternal Father, we give thanks to you for all that you do in our lives. We commend to you all those for whom we have prayed and ask that you use us and our prayers to make a difference in their lives. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and King. King of Kings and Lord of Lords, in your mercy hear our prayer. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, we pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, now we're going to sing another hymn, which is uh, a new one, I think, to many of us, but it's a lovely hymn, and I'd really like to encourage you to listen to the words. It's called, All Praise to Him.
And so now we come to our closing prayer and blessing. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end, for he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. So now we say the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May the light of Christ, the King of all, shine ever brighter in our hearts that with all the saints we may shine forth as lights in the world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love this day and always. Amen. Well, that really does bring our service to a close. Thank you so much for being with us on this Christ the King Sunday. We hope that you've enjoyed our service. Um, please join us again next week online. Look out for that link and share it with all your family and friends and all those who might be interested. Now, of course, we can't have services in church at the current time. Our buildings are closed, but they are open for private prayer. So if you're in the vicinity, in the neighborhood, then please come along and use them for that purpose. But in the meantime, look Look after yourselves, take care of one another, goodbye and God bless and we'll see you next week.